and I will try hard to be as entertaining as possible. I, I know it's hard to compete with Roger Waters and, and Richard Gilmour, but I try, I will try hard, I, I, I promise you. Um, maybe a few words about myself and my T-shirt, um, where I'm coming from. Maybe you've read some of our stuff. Maybe you visited already some of our webinars. Uh, I've been working in enterprise architecture for 15 years now. And, and after 10 or 12 years, I felt really frustrated with the practice, with the bodies of knowledge. And I thought, I must write my book. And then my publisher Springer tell me, told me, yeah, maybe you will sell 200 pieces and that's not really the impact we wanted to have. And, and that's the reason why I founded Architectural Thinking Association three years ago. And recently, half a year ago or so, um, we started a new association and it's called Intersection Group. But, but because before I go into some details here, some administrative stuff, there will be a recording so it makes me even more nervous. Let's see. Uh, and you will get the slides afterwards. And there will be a Q&A. So there are maybe 30, 35 minutes of presentation. And then you can ask. Or please type any question to the chat. And, and then after the show, I will look. And we can answer your questions, hopefully. Yes. And so uh, half a year ago, we started Intersection Group. And that's a merger between architecture and design, enterprise design, driven by Milan Günther. He wrote the book seven or eight years ago. And after two years of architectural thinking, we came to the conclusion that enterprises must not only be architected, they must also be designed. And there are so many disciplines in this enterprise we need to connect and architecture where I'm coming from. I'm an engineer. Many of you probably are. I don't know. I know some names here already. Uh, we are engineers and IT people. We come from the blue. We have this analytical thinking. And, and today's topic is in the blue. So capabilities for us is probably the, the, the most important concept we have in the blue circle. But we must be aware, and it's just a teaser for our upcoming webinars, um, that it's not only about, not only about uh, the, the architecture. It's also about identity experience and we will touch it a bit today. So I call this webinar the next generation capability maps. That's a bit pitchy. I, 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 yes, that's true, but we have many people here today. So it's even people here, it seems to work. So the question is why do we need a next generation? What went wrong? What, what problem do we see with what's on the market today? There are so many enterprise architecture tools that generate capabilities. It's in Toga, in Bispoke, in Gartner Group, and, and so on. But so, so what's the problem? Why do we need to reframe it? And there are some things in my point of view. So I think business capabilities have been invented at business schools. 50, 60 years ago. So there are papers from Stanford and Harvard um, where Tease and Penrose and other names started resource-based planning and used capabilities for strategic management, for organization design, for all those stuff of things. But if you look at companies, uh, what's there, you will see maybe a process management department and when you ask long enough, you will be contacted with the enterprise architects team and they probably have a capability map, but it's not very well known outside of the enterprise architecture ivory tower. So I, as a summary, I think it's a very IT centered view. So the original idea from the fifties or from the sixties, in my point of view, have been captured by the IT people, by we know the bodies of knowledge, right? We know Togaf, Bispok, um, they are driven by IT-minded people. And that's not a bad thing, of course. But if you look at the concept as they are today in those bodies of knowledge and their definitions, it becomes clear that it's an IT-centered view because they suggest, well, we must model capabilities around information entities. And that's the fundamental problem. And that's also the problem why we are not really connected with Business Architecture Guild anymore, uh, because that, it wasn't possible to connect. Uh, because in our point of view, capabilities are much too valuable to be IT components. They are business components, as we will see later on. Another thing is, when you look what's out there, there are not really practical design patterns. So how to do it? And if you Google, you can do it now. Google for capability maps and look what's there. You will find very different granularities, very different styles, very different layouts. So does it mean a 
how do, do we do it? So uh, that's not really much of practical advice. There is a bit in, in Tugov and Bispok and in others, uh, other communities, that's true. But I, it seems as if they don't lead to what I would such see as a good capability map. We will discuss what, what good means. For me, ugly, for example. So if you browse it, you will have ugly colors. You will have see ugly alignments. You will have language terms I call everything management and so on and lots of text that makes these capability maps really hard to use and for me it's absolutely no surprise that the way we do capability models today that it's not very present outside the architecture communities we use it to align it yes we do use it for application portfolio design yes but they are so powerful if you put it out out of the it every tower and that's what we will talk about today so we want to reframe it and what I present today is the result of maybe one year of discussion with a group of people. So in our community as intersection group, we have 70 members now and we have a group that we meet bi-weekly and we want to reframe it. So we will publish a paper shortly that will be called reframing the concepts of business capabilities and today see this as a draft version so not everything is finalized not everything is published so it's an early version if you want but i think the fundamental ideas how we want to reframe it is already there so wouldn't it be nice to have a concept that helps you to design adaptive organizations that's the major shift from my point of view and i hope many of you have read this exciting book, Design for Digital, Jeannie Ross, Martin Mocker, Cynthia Beth, many of you probably have read this. And they talk a whole chapter about reusable business components. When I talked to one of the authors, Martin Mocker, he's also a member in our association, and I asked him, how do you design reusable business components? What are they? In, in, in the 2006 book, Jeannie Ross called it reusable business processes. So there was some change. So 10, 15 years later, they call it reusable business components, but they don't call it capabilities. They don't, they don't connect to any concept of the business architecture. And that's for me was a bit of a surprise. So what does it mean? And so we want to pick this idea of reusable business components in, of this book and want to come up with a conceptual foundation to help companies design adaptive organizations. Because in, in our point of view, adaptive organization comes from business components. It's not enough to follow a value stream. That's the current trend. Next product, focus, organize around the value chain, create a product. Uh, that doesn't lead to adaptivity. Of course it doesn't, because as we will see later, it's about modularity. It's the Lego. Maybe it's this architecture plug and play concept that has been missing in the world of organization design in the world of business, for example. Wouldn't it be lovely to have a concept to connect co-designers? For us, they are the perfect means to connect them. And if you know this famous story of the blind man and an elephant, yeah, so there are six blind men and they touch the elephant from different parts of his body. And somebody says, okay, it's a rope. Yeah, he touches the back of the, of the elephant. Or oh, it's a spear and a snake. So it depends where you are and how you touch this company. And that's what I see in all enterprises today. There are specialized disciplines. And if you talk to the product design people, they have a totally different understanding of the elephant. And if you talk to the software people, they are down to earth of the bloody reality of, of development. I've done that for decades. Um, that that's really that's a two different worlds totally different and with intersection we want to bridge that and capabilities as we will see later are maybe one of the core concepts how we can make this bridge so wouldn't it be nice to have a concept via a stunning user experience make it as simple to use as an iphone for me it means make it beautiful make it easy to use make it clear user language that is common by the business side, align boxes as well. So we will this also see what does what this mean. So within the section, we want to provide that. We want to be the iPhone of, if you want, iPhone of enterprise architecture management, iPhone of enterprise design, whatever. Because for us, it's much more about collaborative design rather than being the big enterprise architect that designs everything top down in quite ugly, ar or somewhat else 
diagram. So we must be aware we as enterprise architects, we're really not good at drawing beautiful diagrams. Designers are much better. And so I'm more than happy that we are connected with the world of beauty and design with our community. And foster a shared understanding. It's about connecting and it's about terminology. It all starts with terminology. I mean, that's that's straightforward. So, right. So it's amazing what happens when you take this elephant and go to the boardroom and there's a discussion with the members and nobody, they don't speak the same language. Uh, and then you say, well, that's the nose. That's the tooth. I always use this elephant. I love it. However, don't need it anymore for now. But it starts with a common language. And as we will see later, this common language is more important maybe than semantic rigor. So we as architects really like to be precise with naming conventions and so on. From my point of view, that's maybe not so important. It's much more important that people agree on a term and the terms has been co have been coined about decades ago. Um, it's very much about common terminology and use their technology, not, not always ours. Um, connect strategy with execution. And there will be a webinar next week. I will do that on design-driven goal portfolio management. So we see capabilities, capabilities, best planning uh, as a strategic instrument. Yeah, well, many bodies of knowledge agree on that. But what does this exactly mean? And how can we really make this connection? Because in reality, capabilities are still a tool driven by business architects or enterprise architects. They're not that present in boardrooms. Maybe when you do IT decisions and we want to bring it there and there are some consequences and we want to connect with the solution development so that the, the connection between strategy and implementation, you might have uh, heard about that from other webinars as well. So, but how to do it? So that, that was the motivation. I think that, that the story is here. We want to open the concepts of capabilities for the business world again. They came from the business side. Then it was captured by IT and made them IT components. Now we say, let's reframe it to help people design adaptive organizations. And that's a major shift for us. And we will do that. So let's start with a definition. And I'm more than happy that we recently connected to those guys here, Bernard Gagnon and Pierre Hadaya. Um, they are members now um, because I've been searching for a definition of business capabilities for some years now. And we know them. They are in Togaf and Bispok. There are some definitions. They are a bit vague and fussy. I'm not so sure. And then I read that book and that's a recommendation. I don't get any money, but I really recommend it. Um, it's a very concise way of business architecture. And what these guys say, and probably we will reuse it for intersection as, as the definition, is that a business capability is a set of resources. So that's the first difference, a set of resources. It's not only information there. It's a connection of different resources and you compose them. Yeah, you, you make, let them work together to give the organization the ability to purposefully produce a particular business output. And there's a lot in this definition output. Some will say, oh, it's about outcomes, not outputs. Output is old school. We are not so sure. So maybe in the blue circle, we can only do resource-based management when we focus on outputs first. And we will have in the in intersection also the connection with the outcome and the purpose and, and, and thoughts. That, that's true. But if you look at this definition, why I was so excited when I saw it, it's really clear and it has some really important messages in it, a set of resources. Not only IT, of course not. Working together in a way that makes sense and that has a clear output. So that's the best definition I found so far, to be honest. And so this is the first example of a capability map. And um, that might not be surprising. That might look similar to what is on the web. There are some differences, and we will cover them shortly. Um, so if you are not aware with the concept, um, a capability map is a hierarchical decomposition of capabilities. So in that case, it's a train operating company. It's a railway infrastructure operation. So they maintain, as you can see on the bottom here, they maintain the railway infrastructure. They maintain the stations and the tracks and the power lines. That's what they are doing. And on top, they need this infrastructure to route the trains and 
have some some railway engine uh, some some uh, some railway companies are driving across their the rail so that's what they are doing and what you see here is the boxes are aligned oh they are aligned that that sounds so obvious but fast it's really important to make it as beautiful as possible but we will talk about that later so that's that's just a quick we will discuss about that a lot just a quick quick yeah that's a capability map it's different from what's on the market as we will see later on and it's an assembly of resources so you have this capability it has a boundary and in this boundary you have a set of resources people some don't like to call people resources in resource-based view they are because they produce cost however but to produce something an output a product product is maybe a special kind of output um, you need people and you need IT and you need buildings and machines so physical assets you need natural resources materials raw materials whatever depends on your industry and you need information and for me this is a very important uh, topic here it's not only about information you need to compose people and it and machines and natural resources to create something that's very straightforward that's really an easy to understand concept so if we go to my capability map um, i have an example here um, the capability here is billing so that's maybe you are familiar with this typical billing. So you have an office building that produces cost. You have a billing officer. That's a role in the organization or a person, if you want. That's, that's the people part. You might have uh, SAP for billing. So that's the IT system. You need the information. In that case, is the, it's the route a certain train has traveled. So you need the information, which railway company traveled across which rails, how, how many kilometers and so on. So you need some information, of course, to produce this bill. And that's pretty much straightforward. And we call that billing, not billing management or manage billing or verb noun. That's a bit in conflict. So that's a bit in conflict. I know that, but we will discuss that later. And if you look at it and we say, how to design for adaptivity so you have this basket or this box and you put in people and it yes we need that that produces some costs and you need to design these capabilities and you need the processes and how does this work together you all need that but what does it mean if you would really design that for adaptivity Everybody's talking about the agile organization. I like to talk about the adaptive organization. It's an important difference because adaptivity is about structure. And adaptivity, as we have learned as IT people, as architects, comes from higher cohesion, loose coupling. Yeah, so that's the concept from the Jordan. I think it was from the 70s. I don't know if it was the first guy who coined it, but we as engineers and IT people have learned that concept in the first year at university. So it's about avoid redundancies in a software component. You want to implement a certain method only once. You want to store a certain data only in, on one place and strive for highest possible cohesion. And cohesion is the degree to which the elements inside a component belong together for some universal purpose. So it's about how connected is it? How strong is the relation between the elements in these capabilities, for example? That's a very important definition. Because if you design capabilities thinking not only I need to decompose it by information, and maybe it's better to decompose it by Let's see what we have as resources. Yeah, Maybe it's better to de decompose it by people that have similar skills, like in research and development. Yeah, That's what you do in research and development. You have a capability to do research and development. And the highest cohesion is between the skills of the people because they are related and they are experts. They can talk to each other. They don't talk to the finance department. They don't need to. They are different language. That's fine. So that means the people in the research department have a high cohesion because they can talk to each other and they have a lot of communications together. They don't have as many communications with the outer world. And that's the idea of components. And with the idea of capabilities, this reframing, we want to apply this good old cohesion concept coming from IT 
to the world of organization design. And we, we are happy to en enough to have some people from org design also in our community. Yeah, so as I expect today, we are mostly enterprise architects. We, I don't need to explain that concept to you. Uh, when we discuss with the organization designer in our community, we have a couple of them also in our association in the intersection group. That is really tough for them. But my message here is, if we manage to make the intersection between this architectural thinking, think in elements, relations, cohesion, hierarchy, so that, that concept from architecture, and bring it to the work of, work of organization design, that will make a huge difference, because organization won't be designed the same way as they are today. But we will discuss that later. So, and now the million dollar question, and we don't have the solution ready yet. That's the bad message, maybe. Um, we are still working on the patterns, Let, let's see. Which resource is the cohesion criterion? So, shall we have a capability around a building or around a machine? And maybe that's a bit abstract, so I have an example here. If we go deeper to the railway infrastructure uh, company here, I have a capability, of course, to build and maintain the infrastructure. That's a cap maybe a central capability of this infrastructure management operator. And then I, they made a decision, and that's a real world example from Austrian Railways. Um, so I've worked for them. Um, they decided that maintaining the station is so different from maintaining the tracks and maintaining the power lines because you need specialized skills, you need specialized machines. It's a totally different thing. And the cohesion criterion in that case is the physical asset. So you group a capability around the maintenance of stations, around the maintenance and the building of tracks. And that's also an implicit decision. They decided that building and maintaining is cohesive because they put it in the box, build and maintain infrastructure. They could have done it, have a build infrastructure capability and a maintain infrastructure capability with enormous consequences on the organization. And it would, this would have led to a weak organization design. They said, no, building and maintaining, that's similar, that had high cohesion. But building maintaining stations is very different from tracks. So they made sub capabilities. And if you go to the top left here, Building project management or construction site planning that's independent from station. So they made the decision that this building project management, the people that do huge building projects, that build stations and tunnels and whatever, that the skill of those people are the highest cohesion, is the highest cohesion criteria. So they did not design a capability, project management for stations, project management for tracks, project management for power lines. No, they said it's the same capability. It's slightly different if you do the project management for stations, it is. And what you can see in this example, it's an intentional design decision. And that's a big thing. If you always ask yourself the question when modeling capabilities, What's the decomposition criterion? It's not only about information. And that's completely wrong if you want to bring it to org design. If you want to build adaptive organization, you must understand what to put together with organizational units around tracks, around machines, around information, whatever. And I have some other examples. I will not go into too much detail. You can do it around the customer touch point here. You can say selling routes, that's a part of a process. Maybe it's a connection to a customer journey. They sell routes. It's not connected to a machine. In that case, it's connected to a customer touch point. Or, yeah, here is the similar skills again. Emergency coordination. That's a process. You need a certain skill and so on. It's the same capability and, and, and for them. It's similar, similar skills. Energy management. Okay, that's more driven again by the asset. So you have energy and you focus your skill around energy and so on. And I have some, some more examples, but I don't want to go into more detail here. But the main issue here is amazing things happen when you get rid of this definition that you always group capability around information. If you get rid of this and change to you group a capability around the thing that has the highest cohesion, magic happens because then you bring capabilities back to the org design and back back to the to the business people again and then recently we are having some discussions if we shall have 
categories of capabilities. When you Google now capability maps, you will see all sorts of structuring. Some capability maps are structured in strategic management processes, operation and support. So that's coming from good old process management. That's the, in the books of process management. You have this management processes, support, and, and core processes. That's one way to categorize business. It is. Um, recently, there are more modern papers that say, aren't we also having change capabilities? T said as a paper by T said, he calls it dynamic capabilities. Shouldn't we make a clear distinction and say, okay, what do we need to be able to for change? like enterprise design, like innovation management. So there are always people focusing on the change aspects and people focusing more on the operational aspect. So isn't it a good idea to make a clear distinction? And the reason why we have these categories now, it's still an ongoing discussion. Shall we have a primary category scheme? I always use it in my projects. I always have customer facing on top. Because for me, it's important to focus the attention of the people that make decisions on the customer. What were the touch points? So then I always model them on top, as you might have seen. So that's that's the, the sales here. If I go back to this, uh, to this slide here. Yeah, so you have this customer facing here on top. And you sell the routes and you do freight terminal services. That's where you are in contact with the customer. And that's where the service design happens. That's maybe the bridge to the service design world and to the product design world. Why not make it explicit in every capability map in, from my point of view? And then below that, you have train operations and railway infrastructure management. They together are the core, if you want, they are the core capabilities. That's the core business, what the, this company does. So that, that they operate train based on the infrastructure they maintain. That's, that's pretty, pretty obvious. And on the right side here, we want to focus on reuse. For us, this is an important category because human resources, I mean, everybody has human resource department. So people are able to design an organization already based on cohesion, but that's, that's no coincidence, of course. Most companies will have a reusable human resource department. You don't do human resources for each of the lines of business. Of course, you don't. And you don't have, you have management, IT operation, finance. So that's that's the typical reused, shared support. In the old world, we we called that support. I'm not happy with support. So our current draft calls it reused because reuse we think is also important for our goal for adaptivity and why not make it explicit in the capability map and why not provide clear guidance to say when you model a capability map please model customer facing on top model operational below model shared or reused uh, on the right side and then we have this discussion with the change capabilities that discussion might not be finished. That's a big discussion. Shall we have things like enterprise design, research and development, innovation? So uh, the people that deal with change every day, digital transformation, that look at operations and say, okay, what, what shall we change? And so shall we put them in a, in a, in a category or not? That The discussion is not, not over yet. Some people say, yeah, change happens also in the lines of business. And that's of course also true, but there are some capabilities like enterprise design, you must establish as a shared capability, maybe, and then TISA calls it dynamic capabilities, um, that, that does it, and not finished. So the message here is, uh, I propose to have ca categories and suggest to use them as a standard. Maybe it's a replacement of good old management, operational, um, support because support capabilities that, that has been invented 40 or 50 years ago with process management categories. Maybe it's time to improve new categories and, and, and make a suggestion say, if you model capabilities, use these categories. But not everybody agrees and we're still in discussing that. And why do we have capability categories? Why should we have it in my point of view? Because you focus attention. That's what you do with a capability map. If you have a beautiful map, you focus the attention on certain boxes. You focus on the structure. So the structure becomes the thinking of the manager. So that's really a powerful instrument. You can guide their thinking. And if you have a category for reuse and for change, you guide the thinking that they must make intentional investment decision. Where shall I 
get better, and they discuss in these categories. If you look outside, what's and if you browse the internet, there's no common scheme how to categorize them. And I think it's a pity because everybody invents it again and again. Today, maybe they are doing it more based on value streams and on processes. I think that's much more pr a prevalent paradigm of today. And then a lot of thinking is we must optimize along the value stream, along the process to create a product. Yeah, and then we will have business adaptivity and it's utterly wrong. And with capabilities, we take the, the counter position and say, oh, it's about adaptivity. It's also about building blocks. And the process is an orchestration of building blocks. And we design those blocks. Get, get rid of this flow for a moment. So that's uh, a bit the difference. And as mentioned in the beginning, Capability modeling is about connecting people. It's a communication instrument. For us, it's a collaboration instrument. So it's about bringing people together. And when I do a capability map, it's very much about having a broad elicitation process. So what I always do is existing documentation. So I start also in my current job. I've started with that. Look what's there. Usually you find a process model. All companies I've been at, they have a process model. That's interesting. Process management has made it to business side capabilities, not yet, however. But I, it's a good starting point if you look at the processes and derive a first version of the capability model. And then what I do, I discuss it with a small group of people. So find the seasoned outliers. That's how I would call them. So the people that all have gray hair already and they know they really know how the business uh, operates and the, the reality of business processes because that's not in the process model. Process model is very far away typically from reality. And when you confront them, that's exciting. Yeah, show the process model to the business experts and then you have a good first version. It's not perfect, of course, but then you need to have a broader elicitation process. Also discusses with application people. That's interesting. Look at the IT applications because a lot of processes and what people really do is hard coded, is coded in these applications. And when you have a certain agreement, you need to go up one hierarchy and then you need to discuss with application with heads of departments, directors or something, middle managers, B-level executives or however. Because what you always find, and I can promise you, you will find it always, when you start capability modeling based from IT, from application processes, you always, you always, always, I guarantee, end up with severe flaws in the organization structure. And that brought us to the idea that at the end, capabilities are an organization design instrument. It's not there in this discipline yet. I know that because they don't really design organizations. So they, 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 there's a lot of improvement we hope to bring also to organization design with intersection. Um, but that's always exciting because you find some overlapping accountabilities. You find some overlapping tasks when you do capability modeling. It's no longer about IT. That, that, that you must be aware about that fact. And then you go to the B-suite and then you get the politics and then it goes boom, yeah, because you bring transparency to them. You make visible that I've done that for one of my employers. Um, I said, okay, though these two departments, it's 70% the same stuff they are doing. I found it out from process and application and so on. And what he did, he changed the org chart. Because I started from IT and, and maybe that's excited, exciting because we can use techniques we've learned in IT, in architecture and bring it to the business world, to the organization design world. That's what we want to do with capabilities. It's not about IT anymore. Connect everybody by beauty. Maybe that's a very important shift. And for us as Intersection Group, and we have a new website, and we work hard to make our creations as beautiful as possible. So the capability maps, the blue one, I haven't done that. I haven't been able to do it. We have a graphics designer, but it's not perfect. I don't say it's the most beautiful thing you can do. Um, at the end, we will also, we want also to have icons, for example. Some people already are doing it. They represent each capability with an icon. That means you need a graphic designer. It's more effort, right? But you need to have it 
because the message here is beauty connects disciplines. It took me a while to understand why those disciplines are so distinct. The enterprise architects and the org designer, they don't talk to each other because our stuff is so ugly. I've created ugly stuff for decades. So really, it's a me, me, need to blame. And with Intersection, I'm so happy to have contact with graphic people because beauty is what connects. It's the iPhone of enterprise architecture management. And if you want to do true enterprise design as a collaborative process, it's a matter of beauty. Because when you bring a capability map, as you can find on the internet, and you go to the boardroom, it takes exactly one second and the C-suite says, I don't even look at it. It's ugly. It's not aligned well. The colors, the text, everything is called management. I don't understand that. So you know how those people are. And for us, the reason why these connections haven't happened yet is we produce ugly diagrams. Uh, be aware about that fact. We should change that and heavily invest, for example. That's a tough one. Use their language versus semantic rigor. And we are not in absolute agreement here. We do have some people in our network that come from this business architecture tradition and this business analysts way of thinking. Yeah, you have a naming convention, verb, noun, uh, energy management, human resource management and development. That would be precise. That's true. But how to bring it in a box? So I write human resource. And if I need to explain it, I write maybe a paragraph on a description of this capability. But I think it's very important to use the term that is most common in the business. And it's HR in my current situation, for example. And I don't have the, the necessity, necessity to impose. And that's what it is. I don't want to impose my rigorous, semantic rigorous language on them. Don't do that. I've seen it in almost any capability maps I've seen, and I know what the BISPOC proposes and, and other bodies of knowledge. Um, get a, rid of that. That has consequences. I know that that's tough. And the problem with language is it's never precise as we want to have it. So that's where architecture gets a bit fussy. Yeah, I know that architecture starts with clear terms and, and, and all of that. That's true. But for us, using their language, connecting them with beauty and as little as few words as possible is much more important than this semantic rigor. That that's maybe the pattern here. Focus on the essence. So usually I have five level one, 10, 20, level two. So there's a don't model everything. Yeah, three levels maybe use colors. Align boxes well. As you can see, we are not good at alignment. I don't know why you will no, never have columns and row like in this example. It's always like <clears throat> no executive wants to see that and you, you lose his attention. And make products visible. That's also, I've seen capability maps where you don't see if it's an insurance company or if it's uh, Spotify, I don't know, because they are too abstract and they want always, always to uh, connect uh, to the product and make, make them visible. Okay, so that's that's the, the, the basic concept content for today. That's but there, of course there is more to come. And capabilities are good on themselves, but they're much better if you connect it to goal portfolio management. So the big question, and we will be discussing it next week, next Wednesday. I will be talking about design-driven goal portfolio management. So that's this capability-based planning connecting strategy with execution. That's a big buzzword. How to do it? Many people say, okay, you need business architecture. Absolutely agree, but how to do it in exactly? I will talk about this next week. Um, with Chris Potts, we have a very renowned person who will help us with that. I really like all his book, if you haven't read them. Um, so it's about pointing with the finger to parts of the elephant and say, I want to improve here. I want to have a larger ear. That's a strategic goal for me. And that's where you can connect strategic management, investment management, goal portfolio management, and so on with capabilities. I'll be talking about that next week. So that's an advertisement. Be there. Uh, it's a part two of the story. And maybe even more exciting. After two years of work, we finally, I think we finally did a seamless connection between the design and architecture space. So what we will hear on May 5th from Annika Klerwein and, and, and Milan Günther is a 
new way of Milky Way. If you haven't attend, attended Annika's webinars, if you haven't read the book, it's really awesome stuff. Because what, what, what we learned there is capabilities, so these are the blue boxes here, are important and you must focus when you want to manage the resources. But you must always be aware how they are connected to the outer world. So the red one, that's the experience that are the top task of the customer. That's the connection with service design, user experience design, all these disciplines. Um, and we will connect them via capabilities to the green. And the green is the identity, the purpose. What are we for? Why do we need this capability? So my capabilities as discussed today, it's only about how to manage resources to produce an output. We don't discuss why? What's the outcome? What's the purpose of this output? It's boring maybe for customers and so on. So that's that's not the focus of capabilities. If you're interested on that, it's on May 5th. So I can re hardly recommend it. I highly recommend it. So and these are just a few slides about ourselves. I'll make it a bit quick. Intersection Group has grown enormously recently and we are very proud very proud that we have this diverse community so it's not about enterprise architects and enterprise designers anymore we have org designers we have some strategy consultants we have miss scott scott Embler, a person from agile delivery for example product owners and so on so i think that's the strength of our community and the only way to produce what we want to produce and we will come up by end of this year with a toolkit we call this the intersection toolkit and capability maps as presented today um, is only one part in the blue it's a very essential connector between other elements of enterprise design as we have discussed today but we must connect it with the red one that's the experience how things feel and with the green one why are we doing it and that will be part in the intersection toolkit and there was a talk i gave last week and you can watch the recording if you want to learn more it's, it's on our website uh, so that's that's the major creation we will come up this year um and yeah and what we also do we create products and we will come up with a publication so we will have this paper reframing the concept of business capabilities ready in fall probably with some really well-known i think some well-known people we will publish it because we think we need to fundamentally nudge this topic into the right direction and and, and we will have a sound paper that will will have the, the fundament for this discussion which is also the foundation for the toolkit so think of us as intersection group as a group of really seasoned experts from various disciplines who co-design creations books and papers and this toolkit and so on that that's what we are and that's the final advertisement so just this for one so that's what we created yes last year that was our first creation enterprise design patterns uh, i think that's the foundation of the discipline of enterprise design there's a lot of patterns that help you when you start as an enterprise design how to connect to people and so on so if you want to learn more there will be webinars in may where we will discuss the, only the pep about these patterns. It's the foundation, I think, for enterprise design as a discipline. Okay, yeah, and then we have this weekly events webinars. If you're interested in learning more, we have this new web page, the intersection group. It's online already. Yeah, it's had some bugs, but I think it works quite well. And, uh, and if you go to events, there you will see our announcement. As you can see, next week I will be talking about this design-driven goal portfolio management. And then we have the talk by Annika and Milan about bridging the gaps of about the Milky Way. All right, that's it. That's the talk for today. Let's proceed to the Q and A. Um, let me see. Okay, so if you haven't already, please ask your questions now, and I will look through the questions. Love your T-shirts. Thank you. That's not a question. Ah, that's a big one. That's a big one. Mark, you're absolutely right. That's a tough topic. And I know in these days of microservices design and, and, and flexibility, redundancy 
is not seen as a problem in, anymore. So this modularity I propose in that, for me, for me, it's the counter position because I see a lot of microservices. No one cares about modularity. No one cares about well-designed modules. And as a consequence, I haven't seen any adaptive organizations out there because if you don't balance your decisions in software design and org design between following process and flexibility, I need to create this product, 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 product. If you don't have any components that are reusable across products, um, you're nowhere because that leads to technical debt and to zero adaptivity and, and so on. That, that's my take. You're absolutely right. It's about a management and a balance between process, product, now, and adaptivity, reuse components. It's not not the fed of today it was 30 years ago maybe maybe it's not so important maybe we are botching i don't know in my view we are botching a bit but however i'm not sure if i understand that one operative models maturity so uh please uh, please try to verbalize it in a different way i don't understand this one Is there a collection of good questions to ask when identifying capabilities? Hmm. Oh, Feder, yeah, you can help me in answering that. I don't have them ready now. Um, what does belong together? So when I do it, I start with what's there. I read the process model. I have a look at the org chart and then I ask, is this a healthy organization? Do I see do we have questions about the accountabilities? Most organizations, when I, when I read the org chart and the process model that's quite often there, I start asking those questions with the department's head and ask them, what are you doing all day long? And they tell, yeah, I'm doing the work. And I talk to the different other, other department and, they, and then if it sounds similar, oh, it could be that maybe the, the org design is not fine. So for me, this, these good questions are always driven by first understanding the processes and maybe the org chart. And then, then what I do is asking questions. Uh, okay, Joseph, reuse applies to all capabilities. That's an interesting one. Okay. Does reuse apply to all capabilities? Well, it means that you have capabilities that can be reused in lines of businesses. That's what I mean. Um, so, of course, you can have micro reuse within capabilities, but the idea to have capabilities that, that is that they are specialized and they are specific and you want to try to be as redundancy free as possible under given certain, in, in, uh, certain circumstances. So, I think, I still think it's a good idea to have a clear category about this reuse capabilities. So, what's next? I love this, Josef, because it took me one year to bring this to the community. Um, we are so good in structure, we are so weak in beauty. And for, for me, there's also beauty in structure. So, if you have a well-designed capability map, it's not only that the colors are beautiful, it's also the, the names that are short, and crisp and you've made you know beauty also comes from making things simpler and drill to the core it's not maybe architects don't have as much time because they are so deep in this reality of bloody software development that, that there's not much beauty in in software development projects not not much time for that there's just a lot of pressure and dealing with the ugly world of legacy debt so absolutely agree we must make things beautiful for me there's also beauty in clarity we must reduce complexity i still will fight for that I'm still but that, that, because there's beauty in clarity also so yes that's a beautiful statement thank you for that Uh, business capabilities and technical capabilities i don't believe that there should be technical capabilities why 
what is it? I, do, I don't see that. What we do have in, and you will, you can have a look at our toolkit where we like, uh, and you can watch the recording. I can I can send it after if you send me a message. I can send it to you. Um, for us, business capabilities are maybe the center of gravity of architecture because it's a business-driven modularity, business-driven architecture approach and capability. Capabilities. And what we do have are IT applications. Maybe that's what you mean, but we as currently we use the term application. This good old you have a IT application, a system, however you call a software package. Um, and then there's a connection because a software package or an IT application supports one or several business capabilities. There is a relation, but it's not, not the same thing. What you can do, and we will also have tools for that, you can have a diagram where you have this capability map and you ha have uh, all the applications that support a certain capability as boxes in boxes. And I think all tool vendors do it exactly that way. So that's the alignment that's that's pretty much straightforward. The problem here is, is that usually capability maps are weak. And if capability maps are weak, business ID alignment is weak. And so the, if the categories are not correct, it's a problem for application portfolio management too. And then, yeah, but maybe that's a different webinar. We have a lot of stuff about that. Okay, how granular should we go in capabilities and sub capabilities. I used to have three categories um, for the purpose I want to use them because I want to bring them to management and I want to make them a central instrument for strategic decisions. I want to have executives that they use the capability maps for every day's management decision. Point with your finger, I want to get better here and so on. And that means that you can't overwhelm those people. So the way I present it, it's more this high level strategic view where many people need to agree. That means that you can't go down five levels. Maybe it makes sense for a business analyst if you do run a certain project or so it makes sense, but I never do that. Um, okay, it gets more and more niche software offerings, yeah. If I understand it right, maybe we shouldn't confuse it with a detailed product model. So the capability model is not the one and only model for everything. So I would have maybe a very detailed product map or a very detailed, I can drill down, of course, but that's not the purpose of capabilities as we use it. Oh, Bayern, thank you. Yes, uh, Sergei. I know that because I've been working for Austrian Biggest Bank for eight years. Um, it's a good starting point. I haven't seen Bayern for eight years now. I don't know how they evolved. But in general, the problem with this industry-specific capability maps, they are a good starting point, but they don't use the language you have in your company. And it's maybe in a foreign language. You have it in English, but the but the people in your company speak German and they don't have the same terminology. So for me, it's not bad to have it. And I know Business Architecture Guild, they work a lot with industry reference model. Makes sense because you can have discussions between industry experts. That's a good idea. I take it as an input. So whenever there is, also for my new company, it's an energy sector. I'm, there is one as I take as an input, but it will be, I think it will be, completely changed when I make it specific for my company. That, that's, that's my take on, on them. Okay, where do you see the change management capability skills related in the cap map? In change or operational category? Ah, that's a hard question. We've discussed it. I don't have the one and only answer. Um, my first answer would be to have it in the change. Um, but I agree that a lot of change is coming in the operation. So maybe we must make a distinction between explicit capabilities you want to have outside of this business unit. So if you, if you have, if you see capability maps as a blueprint for the ideal organization, that's what I do. So I think if you have the perfect capability map, you have an idea of the perfect organization, and then you must ask your ask yourself the cohesion question. So is this change very much related to this business unit, then a business unit does it on its own. It in, innovates 
its, its product. If this is a change we can only achieve uh, as a shared capability, then it's probably a change. Uh, it's also th this cohesion question again. What belongs together? Does this kind of change and innovation belong to this operational capability here, or does it belong uh, somewhere else? Ah, there's some software which provide both exhaustive application interest over Romare and beautiful maps. Archimede is not beautiful, but I do not see Conference Draw as a good app portfolio tool. You don't? I do. <laughs> Thanks for this question, but I use it that way. Um, I agree that one of the problems I have with enterprise architecture tool is that the, the maps they generate, they are not well aligned. You don't have, don't have a way, you, the tools I know, I don't know the latest development probably, you don't have a way to design the layout better. They generate it and then you have a weak alignment and small fonts and, and, and so on. That, that That's tough. So currently, as my understanding is, uh, it's better to do some laborious work then generate it and have it ugly. But I would be more than happy, and we have also, I see someone from a tool vendor here, to have a tool vendor to help us to generate a beautiful capability map. But this all starts with layouting. What, what's beneath each other? What's on top of each other? And then you must configure this layout. So we are running a bit out of time. Okay. Uh, and most, many, many more questions. Okay. Uh, okay, I will answer the next two questions because I want to uh, uh, close in time. Is there still any link to capabilities and the ideal target operation model? Ideal? No, you can't design capabilities for an ideal target operation model because this ideal must be driven by ecosystem customer demands. So when you define an operational model and for me this means organization plus processes what, what what what's our business and so on you must see the enterprise holistically and capabilities alone can do it they're just one input for a holistic enterprise design it's the question of what are we capable of doing and how shall we define our reusable business components it's an inside view it's a very us centered view and with Milky Way, my, May 5th, if you want, we will open it and connect this thinking inside out with outside in. That, that's what will, will happen then. Okay, for now. Okay, so thank you very much for this intense questions. Uh, as you might have noticed, I'm really passionate about this topic because I think it's a big one and we can make a huge, huge change if we open it and bring it outside of the IT ivory tower. And if we connect it, as we will see next week, with strategic planning, strategic gold portfolio management, and if we connect it with customer journeys, customers, product design people and so on, it's not present there. They don't know the concepts usually. Uh, and if we connect it with the why, that's the green circle for us. Why? Why shall I have this capability? That's an important question. Of course it is. So the whole story for now, maybe it, it's unfinished. For today, if you do only capability model, you will have a weak enterprise design, but we all know that. And I uh, invite you to participate in, in next webinars. So next Wednesday, same time, same station, I'll be talking more about the strategic goal portfolio design. And in two weeks, we have Milan and Annika talking about the Milky Way. But for now, of course, we will continue this awesome solo by Pink Floyd. I wish you all a nice evening, nice day. I don't know where you are in the world. Have fun and hope to see as many as possible of you next week. See you.